Hi everyone, welcome again to Westside Online. It's great to have you joining us today. A couple of weeks ago, I looked at a study. I mentioned a study briefly that I'd come across and I wanted to do more research on it. And I just found it really interesting. The, um, the head of the study claims it's one of the long longest studies ever taken about human life. They started back uh, before World War II and they had two groups. They had people who were university students, all males, from Harvard University. And there was about 724 of these men and they started to talk to them about their life, their relationships, their health, a whole lot of things like that. And they started to track them. Now, studies like this tend to fall over fairly quickly. Either the people drop out, um, the researchers go on to another topic, uh, funding dries up, and some of these studies, you know, they're flat out if they last five or ten years. And this one has still been going since the 1940s, I believe. And it's an incredible number of people, out of the 724 that started, 60 are still alive, many of them in their 90s now. And not only interviewed Harvard graduates. They went to one of the poorest neighbourhoods in Boston. A whole lot of um, very underprivileged boys and they tracked them over time. And these people, they're, they're now in their fourth or fifth person who's in charge of the study. They've kept it going. They've now included children of the original people and their grandchildren and the, the wives of the people. So it's, it's thousands of people now that they're tracking. And they found some very interesting results. They don't just send out a questionnaire once a year and, and, and have it back. It's quite a detailed process that they go through. They interview people face to face. They video interview them with uh, interactions with their family members, particularly their wives. They get their medical records from the doctor. And it's quite a detailed study on how their life is going. Some of them think, you know, my life isn't that interesting. But um, they, they continue to participate after all these years. And these are some of the key findings that they've, they've learned out of this, of studying these men. They had different trajectories in life. They said some of them, there was one person in the study that probably we all know, John F. Kennedy. He rose to be President of the United States. And many of these men just rose to high rank and really had an upward trajectory in life. Some of them were the opposite. They went downhill, they suffered all sorts of medical episodes, many of them died in the war, and there was all sorts of things going on. But through this study, 85 years of, of data, tens of thousands of pages of research and interviews, and in a sense it's sort of, you know, so much money, so much time spent on something that, that we sort of, I think, deep down already know. And the key finding is this. Good relationships keep people happier and healthier. That's pretty basic, isn't it? But over time, as much as we want money, as much as we want fame, as much as sometimes people want success or to have a comfortable lifestyle or whatever, it's relationships that come through again and again. Social connection is good for life expectancy. More than some medical things. People had all sorts of medical issues, but as long as they were in good relationships, they had a lot better odds of getting through this than other people who had similar ailments but had broken relationships. The opposite they found was also true. Isolation kills. Loneliness is toxic to human beings. People who had these not good relationships or were isolated from others through their own choice were less happy, they, uh, their health declined sooner, their mental function deteriorates earlier, they live shorter lives in, in basics. Good relationships not only protect the body but the brain. Their mental function was better if you had a good relationship. Cognition remains better. It doesn't even always mean even that the relationships were smooth because a lot of the researchers noticed that in the husbands and wives talking they would disagree with each other. They couldn't um, agree on certain things. They were bickering. But at least the relationships were secure and they were committed. And it made all the difference in their lives. Fascinating study. 
And I find it fascinating because it really backs up what the Bible has been saying for so long. It's relationships that is the key. As we look at today, I called the message 360 degree love. Because sometimes we love in quadrants. We, we would love ourselves, but we have a hard time loving other people. Or we love other people, but we don't like ourselves and God gets left out. Or we love God. You know, if we could just spend time with God, that would be great. It's just the re human relationships are, are a real downfall. 360 degree love encompasses all of that together. And it's something that the Bible has been saying. Jesus commanded it. God commanded it. Not just because that's part of his plan and that's part of his will, but he knows it's good for us. He wants good things for us. But because life is messy, because life is complicated, because we are sinful, we tend to mess up and muck up relationships. And that's why we've addressed this in this series. Why can't we all get along? Because sometimes it is frustrating that we can't. We've tried to look at that over the series. If you haven't seen a lot of the messages, I encourage you to get online. We're looking at wisdom in relationships, setting boundaries, marriage, all sorts of things. But I really urge you, because it's good for you to, to do the work you need, to make the changes that have to happen for you to prioritise relationships. So we want to look at 360 degree relationships today, 360 degree love in all sorts, of, all sorts of areas. The ones that Jesus said were most important. He um, answered a lot of questions in his day and people came up and basically said, look, you know, of all the 700 commandments that, that us Jews have, have worked out, what's the most important? What's, how do you summarize it? If you could you know, give us a top three or something like that. In two places in the Gospels we read what Jesus answered. He said this, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourselves. In another gospel it says this, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So when it comes down to it, when life is all over, whether you've got three or 30 or 30,000 days to live, what it comes down to, what is most important in God's eyes and what is going to be most beneficial for you is to develop good relationships. And we're going to have a look today at those 360 degree love relationships that God wants us to have. And we'll start like we do in the, the award shows. We'll go from, from least to first. And the first one that we're going to look at that is the least one, in a sense, is love yourself. That's still important. Love yourself. And Jesus says, in effect, you know, I'm going to start here with this inborn, uh, deep human trait. We love ourselves. It's a powerful instinct. We have self-preservation right from an early age. If we're hungry, we eat. If we're thirsty, we drink. If we're cold, we put on clothes. Um, we, we look after ourselves. We just have this basic thing built into us, even from creation. It's not part of the fall to look after yourself, to, to have this idea that we look after ourselves. We, we, we love ourselves. We give priority to us. Now, at times we've got to deny ourselves. That's true. And it's not about being selfish. It's not about being self-centered. But you have certain needs, and that's okay to, to want to meet those needs for yourself. You, you, you want friends to hang out with you. You want to be treated with dignity and respect. You, you expect things for yourself. You want things so that you live a healthy life. Everyone, without exception, has this human trait. Now, sometimes it can go down wrong tracks. Uh, we can hate ourselves. We can deny ourselves too much. But deep within us is that innate thing from a young age to want to look after ourselves. 
and it comes as part of our humanity. It's okay to love yourself. But Jesus goes on, the second one, the second most important thing, is to love others as you love yourself. And we see here that the Greek is one of these things that can be reversed. And it says, you know how to love yourself. You know how to look after yourself. You know how to meet your own needs. Great. Love others like that. Interesting thing someone pointed out is that word for others can be like a neighbor, but it can also be an enemy. We've looked at this series when Jesus said, you know, it's easy to love people who are like you. The challenge is to love everyone, to love people like God loves you. And that's what we are called to do. When Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, it's a big word. It's not saying, love your neighbor instead of yourself. That's not what he's saying there. He's saying, you know how to love yourself. You know how to meet your own needs. You know how you want to be treated. Well, love other people like that. Have, have some thought, have some ideas about how you might meet other people's needs just as you have some thought about how you meet your own needs love your neighbor as yourself it combines the two important loves yourself and other people it's assumed that you will love yourself it's then commanded that we love other people so you often find if something's really important if we prioritize things in our lives and whatever it is for you, that you really like to do, that, that you will find ways to do it. You will sacrifice for it. You will save up so that you can buy it. You will take time off so that you can enjoy it. All of these things are really important for you. Jesus says, how about putting that sort of time and effort, not just into your own happiness, but be creative in find ways that you can love others like that. And, and, and that means finding out what they want. I used to joke with our kids, you know, when they were young and wanted to buy, you know, mum a Mother's Day present or a birthday present. Oh, you know, can I have this? This toy would be good. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's loving. It's, you know, doing unto others as you would have them do to you. You know, I want that, so maybe she will want that. Well, no, it's not quite that. It's, it's not give yourselves, give, give other people the same things as yourself. It's love them in a way that they want to be loved. What is, what is their needs? What are, what are their things? Have, have a thought through how they want to be treated. What are their interests? You might not be interested in that at all, but out of love for others, you're called to love them like that. To be creative. To be sacrificial. To go out of your way. To, to know that you're secure in yourself and you're just looking out for others and how you can love them. Just as you long for food when you're hungry... Are there people around who might be longing for food and they're hungry in their lives? If you're longing for good things and, and you want good stuff, is there something you can do for others to, to give them a good blessing? There's things that we can do if we get our minds off ourselves. It doesn't say just stop at loving us. It's you know how to love you. Well, love others like that. Get your mind off yourself long enough to be focused on other people, not just your friends and neighbours, but even people that you don't know. If you want your life to count and be significant, show people that they count and they're significant in the way that you treat them. Go out of your way, even if you're shy, to, to talk to them, to give them a welcome, to be with dignity and respect around these people. Is there someone else apart from you that you would put that time and effort into, those things that you like, that you could love someone else with. And of course the number one, the number one thing that God told us to do, that Jesus said summarizes the commandments, is to love yourself, is to love others, but to love God. So when it comes to answering the question that, uh, that Jesus was asked, he was quoting from the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. And this is the most important command. That, that, you know, rather than get, just get self-seeking and just look after yourself for a while, it's important to love yourself, that's true, but don't just stop there. Instead of just um, loving others and, and focusing on their needs and seeing what you can do to pursue their goodwill, 
don't just stop there. The first and the most important thing is to love God. Now, as I said, Jesus quoted from the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament. And there's a whole lot of things there that, uh, that Jesus has, has left out. But it's interesting the way that God puts this across in, in Leviticus about what he wants people to do and how he wants people to behave. Let's read some of them. Each one of you must respect his mother and father, and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make gods of cast metal for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. Verse 9, when you reap the harvest of your land, don't reap to the very edges of the field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Don't go over your vineyard a second time to pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Don't curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind, but fear your God. I am the Lord. Don't go about spreading slander among your people. Don't do anything that endangers your neighbour's life. I am the Lord. And it's interesting that this whole chapter contains all these sort of things that that sort of bizarre in in our eyes, but it's about mating of animals and um, weights and measures and consulting mediums and psychics and all with the, the, these things about how, how to treat people, but they all finish with the same thing. Don't do this because I am the Lord your God. And, and it's not like God saying, you know, and I remember for my mother when she'd say to do something, you say, why? And she'd say, because I'm your mother and I said so. But it, it's much deeper than that. It's saying because I'm God and because I love you, And because I want you to love me, then there's certain ways that you act. There's certain things that you do. There's a certain fairness that that you need to do in a whole range of things that reflect who I am. And I don't want you acting in certain ways that go against what my character is. There's ways that you love me by obeying these sort of things. Don't, you know, curse a a deaf person. They're not going to hear you. You know, that's mean. Don't trip a blind man. He can't see what, what, what's going. That, that mean. And God says, I'm not like that. That's not my character. If you want to love me, then act in these ways that reflect who I am. Do this because I am God. And loving him reflects in a whole lot of things, even the basic things of life, of how we treat ourselves, because we are someone he loves, and he doesn't want us not loving someone he loves. Love other people, because that's someone he loves, and he wants us to love him, and the ways that we express it is like this. And in Jesus' answer to the question, he said there's four things of how to love God. Love God with your heart. Love God with your whole heart, a pure heart, not mixed, not, 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 not selfish. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, The purpose of my instructions is that all the Christians there would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and sincere faith. You know, unfortunately, sometimes I think people love God out of an insincere heart. They love him for what he can give them, not just for who he is. They love God with a mixed heart because they think, if I love him, if I treat him well, then maybe he will give me... Uh, blessings, or maybe he will get me out of the jam that I'm in. It's not really sincere. It's not pure. Love God with all your heart. As that verse we looked at in Proverbs says, guard your heart. It is the wellspring of life. And there's so many things that we need to be pure about in our love of God. The second one is love God with all your soul. That we would apply the, the passion that we have For some things in life, some of us are very passionate and and would pursue things and sacrifice for things, pay for a lot of things. God says, love me with, you know, sometimes we have that expression, you put your heart and soul into it. Well, love God with your heart and soul. Now, one trouble of this is that over time we, we lose that. Albert Schweitzer said the tragedy of life is not just when someone dies, but when something dies inside of someone. And sometimes that passion is is like that. 
instead of loving God with heart and soul, it's just, oh, so what, you know? Paul says, as he writes one of the letters to the Romans, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. So don't lack in it. Be zealous. Be, be zealous for the right things. And he says, you know, keep your spiritual fervor because there's that assumption that we can lose it. We lose it over time. We get beaten up by life. We don't feel God has treated us as we think he should. And we just somehow lose that passion. And it's really important to be passionate for the right things. Jesus said, love God with all your mind. It's your intellect, your common sense. Now, I'm certainly not against formal education. I think it's really important to, to not just be passionate and enthusiastic, but, but be well thought out in our faith. Sometimes our, our thinking is a little fuzzy. You don't switch your brain off when you come in the door. Faith is not just about fairy tales and just that believing, touchy-feely stuff. Our faith is based on actual events. A Bible scholar once said that I'll, I'll eat a page of my New Testament if I can find a renowned scholar, someone in ancient history who teaches at a recognized university who doesn't believe that Jesus existed. Now, his Bible is still intact. He's never eaten that because people that study that history, people that are peer-reviewed, except that Jesus was a man of history. There's an intellect behind what we have in faith, and it's good to exercise our minds and not be lazy with the way that we go about it. Os Guinness said, God has given us minds, but we have left them undeveloped or underdeveloped. God has given us education, but we've used it for other ends. God has given us opportunities, but we've failed to grasp them because we've refused to think them through before him. Love God with your mind. For some people, that's a stretch, but it, we, we, need to be, we need to be challenged intellectually to think through the deeper things of faith and love God with our mind. And the final one is love God with our strength. Put your effort into it. We, it's State of Origin this week here where we are, and, and you know the, the, the saying of the football field, I left everything out on the field. You know, I gave it my all. I've got nothing left. You know, Do we have that sort of strength love for God? Do we give him everything? Do we show it with our actions or we just it's just all words? But where's the sacrifice? Where's the passion? Where's the energy that we put towards it? Where's the strength? Often for people if it's too hard, if it's too early, if it's too long, they're gonna back out. If it's too difficult, if it's too awkward, where's the loving God with our strength part? The Apostle John says, Dear children, let us just stop saying we love each other. Let us really show it by our actions. And we often stop short in loving God of what we would do if it was something that we were really interested and passionate about. Look, that's a good time to, to just take a break and, and just remember where all this love comes from. God wants us to do that because... As we saw with that really important study, love is so key to human life and happiness. Good relationships, working through our difficulties, uh, managing our expectations, all of that is really good for human life. But we do that and it's easier for us to love when we understand that we are loved. That God, the God of the universe, who created all this, and even though we have acted sometimes as if he didn't exist and we've ignored his will and his ways, one of the things that comes through again and again for us is that God loves us. Again, John talks about this in one of his letters. You know, we, we don't start with love, even though there's probably great examples of people who have loved God or loved other people with, with great sacrifice. We don't start there. The understanding of love comes from the fact that God loves us and that God would give his son, even though there's times where people have not accepted that love, where, where he knew that would happen, but he still loved us anyway. But when we do receive that love, when we do accept it, it's great to know that we are loved and it gives us a capacity that fills up 
The Bible says literally we're filled up with love so that we have ability to love others. So let's take time to remember that great sacrifice, to just bask and just to accept his love today, wherever you're at, that there is a God who loves you and he wants you to love others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful love that you've given us. That you love us completely, unconditionally, fervently, passionately, sacrificially. And we all see it, Lord, in this, this tiny emblem of the bread and the cup, reminding us of the body and blood of Jesus that he gave for us out of love for us. So as we eat and drink today, help us not just eat and drink the physical things, the little bits that are there or whatever people are having at home. But Lord, just bask in your love and know the warmth and the glow, the fact that you love us. Lord, we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you take the bread now? Well, you take the cup now and let's drink it together. Father, I thank you for the fact that you love us. That everyone listening to this broadcast today, you love them. No matter what they've done, no matter what they feel about themselves, no matter how they feel, you love them with an incredible love. And I just pray, Lord, that everyone would know that, would feel that, would be able to experience that. And you'd give us all the capacity to love better, to love deeper, to love ourselves, to look after our own needs, but not to be so, so self-centred in that, that we forget other people. And that we would have a focus on what other people's needs are and meet that in a in a creative, in a passionate way to show other people your love too. And that we would express ourselves in all sorts of ways, loving you, heart and soul and mind and strength, doing things as an expression of love because it reflects on your character. So well, thank you for this time together today. Thank you for the importance of relationships that that we see in these studies that we know from Scripture is true. Thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for listening in today. I really appreciate your time. And we'll see you next week for the final in our series, Why Can't We All Just Get Along? See you then. Goodbye.